Well, good morning, Grace family. We hope you're doing well wherever you may be. And we're glad we're able to provide you this video resource and hope you find it to be an encouragement to your faith today. Before we get going, there's a question I would like you to consider that I've been thinking about a lot lately, and it's this. How do you prepare for worship? I think this is a very important question that we need to be asking ourselves. You might think back when heading out of the house to attend Sunday worship was your normal weekly routine. What was that like for you? Was preparation limited to the frenetic collecting of children, snacks, and diapers? Or maybe it was trying to convince yourself that going to church is better than sleeping in or heading down to the beach. And what about now? What if going to church is limited to hitting the play button on your computer or showing to a home with only a handful of other folks? What does preparation look like in those contexts? How should we prepare? Well, let me offer some encouragement to you. First of all, anytime we come to worship the Lord, wherever we are and in whatever form that might take, we should come prepared to receive. God will speak to us as His Word is preached, as well as when we engage in worship through song. Hearing from God is a weighty and glorious thing. To see God for who He is, to be overwhelmed by His greatness and holiness, to experience His presence, to see His boundless love and mercy, an encounter that should make our hearts tremble. So one way to prepare for worship is to ask God to help you receive His revelation with gratefulness and humility. Secondly, we should prepare to respond. When God reveals Himself to us, things happen. Experiencing God leads us to respond. Rather than being a spectator or a passive participant, our hearts are moved to worship because we have once again seen the beauty, greatness, holiness, mercy, and love of our God. We sing to Him. We confess our sins, receive His Word as it's preached, give of ourselves in grateful response to seeing who God is and what He has done for us in Jesus. So prepare for worship by asking that God would help you rightly respond to Him. And then finally, we should prepare to edify others. Our worship doesn't stop when the singing ends, or the benediction is given, or the video is stopped. Worship continues as we love one another, when we encourage each other, when we serve in any way we can, when we pray for each other and care for one another. And so many of these things can happen even if we're not able to meet in person in our regular ways. If you're in an in-home gathering, or even if you are having to isolate in your home, you can pick up the phone. You can send a text or an email. Give of your finances. Pray for a friend. The sky is the limit. Do you come to worship expecting that God will use you? Everyone has a part to play. It doesn't need to be a public showing, but it can be profound in its impact. So let's come prepared, expectant to meet God, expectant to respond, and expectant to edify. And when you do, I have no doubt you will experience a joy. And what's more, God will use you, and really important things will happen as a result. So let's just take a moment of silence right now and go to God with this. Offer yourself to Him in this way. Ask Him to help you encounter Him, to respond to Him and to love others. Ask Him to give you a fresh vision for what it could look like to enter into worship ready for anything that he has for you. Father, we want to encounter you. We, we don't want to be people who just go through the motions because, well, it's just what we're used to doing. We want to know you deeply. We want to unify around you. We want to grow in our faith together. We want to be mature people measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Lord, we don't want to be tossed and blown by every new idea or ideology 
We want to be able to discern truth from error. We want to be more like Jesus. So Lord, help us see you and help us see our part in this great work you are up to in the world. May we be a people, a church family that helps one another grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Praise Him, you heavens and all that's above. Praise Him, you angels and heavenly hosts. Let the whole earth praise Him. Praise Him, the sun, moon, and bright shining stars. Praise Him, you heavens and waters and skies. Let So this week we'll be back in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, and we'll be looking at how we are God's workmanship. So here it is, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, 
This is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of the Lord. So this morning we're continuing our journey in the second chapter of Ephesians, same passage as last week, but this week we're going to focus in on verses 8 through 10. And let me just say right up front, these are three of my favorite verses in all of Scripture, and they they capture this really important dynamic that I want to focus our time on this morning. And the dynamic is this. In verse 8, we learn that we are saved by grace alone, not by our works. But then in verse 9, we learn that we're saved to do good works. So we're not saved by works, but we are saved for works. And I want to talk about that dynamic and just get inside of it this morning. So first, let's look at this idea that we have been saved apart from any works we do. Let me read again verse 8 and 9. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Obviously, the point there being we are saved by grace alone, apart from our works. And last week, we looked at verses 1 through 7, this beautiful picture of how we were born into this world and without God, into this place of spiritual death. We were the walking dead. And we were caught up in this complex network of factors, including our own sins, including the ways of the world, and even the spiritual powers that are at work. But how God, by His sheer grace, made us alive, forgave us, and set us on this new trajectory towards eternal life with Him. And the point Paul's making now in verse 8 and 9 is that that was all by His sheer grace. And there's like four different ways he says that. Let me just mention them to you. For it is by grace you've been saved. It wasn't by your works. It wasn't something you deserved or earned. It is all God's free grace. That's how He saved you. And it happens through faith. Again, not according to works that you do. It's a simple act of trust and something that God has done for you through Jesus Christ. That's how you're saved. And if we didn't get it by now, he goes on to say, and this is not from yourselves. Even the faith itself is not from yourselves. It is a free gift of God. If we haven't figured out still, not by works in so many different ways. You guys didn't do this. You couldn't earn this. You didn't deserve this. This was something God did out of his sheer grace. It is a free gift that you simply receive through Faith And the great implication of this, of course, is at the end of verse 9, so that no one can boast. When you understand the gospel of your salvation and how it works, you realize, I have absolutely nothing to brag about, to boast about. This had nothing to do with something in me that was special. This had everything to do with something in God, His love and mercy, that was given to me out of His sheer grace. And so I'm left just humbled and grateful, and I am not going to brag about any of this because I had nothing to do with it. It is all God's work. I just receive it by faith. All right, all that to say, we are saved by grace, not by our works. And this is this fundamental, foundational doctrine of Christianity. Salvation by grace through faith apart from works. But then in verse 10, Paul goes on to talk about the other aspect of this dynamic, which is, yeah, we are saved apart from our works, but we are saved for good works. Let me read verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And Paul's point in this passage is to say this, God's grace changes people. That's what it does. It doesn't just forgive them. It doesn't just get them off the hook for their, for their sins. It actually changes them into new kinds of people who live new kinds of lives. And Paul uses a great word here. My translation says, we are God's handiwork. That word handiwork. In the Greek, that word is poema, where we, of course, get our English word poem. So Paul's saying, we are God's poem. Or other translations say, we are his his work of art, his masterpiece, his handiwork. It's this beautiful picture that God has done something in us. He says, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus. So the, the, the handiwork that he's done in us happens when we come to faith. So 
Paul's not talking about God's creating us in our natural birth when we were born, although that too is a, we're, we're a great poem of God. We're a beautiful masterpiece just by being born. But he's referring to what God did in us when we had our spiritual birth, when we came to faith, when, when we had a new birth. He's saying that God did something in our hearts when we became Christians. He, he wrote a new poem. He, he made a new creation inside of us. He gave us new spiritual life when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Here's how he puts it in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. That's the new handiwork, the new creation. So let me just tease out that verse. The old that has gone was defined fundamentally by the self, right? Ourselves were at, at the center of the old creation. We lived for ourselves. We tried to control our own lives and run our own lives and call the shots. And we tried to prove ourselves and and justify ourselves in the world and protect ourselves. But when we came to Christ, when God gave us new life, the new creation where there was self before, that's replaced with essentially faith. That is the new work that God does. This is work of faith that we now have this deep down trust in God's love, in his approval, in his forgiveness and his protection, his provision for us. And so we now have this fresh hunger and thirst for him. That is the new creation. That is the poema, the masterpiece that God is working in us. And many of us can remember what that experience was like when God worked that poema in us, especially if we became Christians as adults. We remember what life was like before, and we remember the inside out changes that God made in our hearts and our minds to bring us to him and to set our lives on this new path. It's this beautiful masterpiece of new creation inside of us. And with that new creation comes a changed life. It's just always what happens when that's an authentic new creation. And that's what Paul goes on to say. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So he says, um, God prepared these works for us to do. Literally in the Greek, it says, he prepared these good works for us that we might walk in them. There's these deeds that God wants us to walk into. And he's contrasting earlier in the passage in verse two, when he talked about we were the walking dead, right? We were at one point walking in sins and transgressions. And now God has recreated us, set us on a new course so that we can now walk in good deeds, deeds of love, deeds of mercy and patience and generosity and gratitude, right? And service, all these ways that we are now to live our lives in Christ. And what I love about this is Paul describes these new works as something which God prepared in advance for us to do. Meaning these aren't works that we have to kind of drum up on our own or think up on our own. God has actually prepared these works in advance. And the image that I've always had is it's like this. It's like God found us when we were, before we came to faith, and we were walking around in the mud of of our sins and transgressions. And what God has done is he's given us new life. And it's like he's now laid out this red carpet before us of good deeds, of good works, good actions. And each day we get to then walk on this carpet, which God has prepared in advance for us. We step into these good works every day. And some of these good works will be, will be dramatic and radical. They might be, we might end up doing things we never would have guessed we would have done before we came to faith in Jesus. Uh, most likely, most of the good works that we walk into will be simple. They'll be mundane, daily acts of faithfulness, as simple as having patience for our children or reaching out to our friends when they're hurting or um, being able to resist temptation in a moment or pausing throughout a day just to spend time with God and be with Him. These simple, basic acts that together lead to this life of love and faithfulness and humility and generosity. These beautiful works. So, okay, all that to say, there's this beautiful dynamic in the gospel where we are saved on the one hand, apart from our works, but then we're recreated and saved for good works that we get to walk into every day of our lives.
And I want to say mainly today that it, it's so important that we hold those two sides of the dynamic together, that we are saved by grace alone, and yet we are saved for good works. And my experience is in, in the church, a lot of churches don't know how to hold those two things together. And so some churches just grab onto the first part of that equation. We're saved by grace, apart from works, period, end of story. And so really the gospel is just about God's forgiveness and we want to protect that at all costs. And that's what we talk about. That's all we talk about. And anytime someone starts talking about like the need for obedience or the need for discipline in the Christian life, these people kind of get really nervous and they say, that sounds like a Pharisee and that sounds, you know, kind of self-righteous and like workspace righteousness. And the problem with that is, is that if that's all we're holding onto, that will leave people very content in their sin um, in a way that God doesn't want. And then you have other churches, I think, that, that just hold on to the second one. And they're, they're very moralistic in their, um, in their outlook on life. And, and they're calling people to good works and to you know, go out and live lives worthy of the gospel. But it's not really rooted in the grace of God. And uh, it's just done in people's own willpower. And over time, people burn out on that. It's just a hard way to live. And I think for Paul, neither of those would make sense on their own. I mean, he sees those as so deeply integrated, that we're saved apart from our works, and yet we are saved for good works. And here's what I think holds the two together in Paul's theology. It's simply this. I think it is grace that actually holds the two together. Paul has a very, I'd call a very robust, a very big view of what grace is. Because in Paul's theology, uh, grace is the thing that saves you and forgives you, Uh, But grace is also the thing that changes you and enables you to live the life that God has called you into. Grace is the thing that does all of that. And I think a lot of us have grown up with a very small and limited view of what God's grace is. And what I mean by that is I think some of us, when we think of grace, we just think that grace is the thing that you get when you mess up. (laughs) Right? If someone were to ask you, what is grace? You'd say, oh, it's like when you're trying but you fail. Well, then that's when the grace of God kicks in. Grace is the thing you get when you mess up. And I think Paul would say, no. Well, yes, of course it's that, but it's so much more than that. Grace is the thing you get when you mess up, but grace is also the thing that enables you not to mess up. (laughs) Grace is God's undeserved favor working for you in so many different ways. You need God's grace when you disobey. But you need God's grace to obey in the first place. In in fact, you need way more grace to obey than you do to disobey, right? It doesn't take any grace to disobey God. It takes a lot of grace to obey God. And that's what grace is available to do, is to empower you to live the life that God is calling you into. And so the danger is when we disconnect those two different things and we think, yeah, I know that my salvation was by God's grace through faith and all that, but my basic idea is, okay, God, you saved me by your grace, and I guess now it's up to me to try to live a life that's worthy of the salvation I got, right? And so we kind of set off and think, okay, I got to do this, and God's watching. I hope I, hope I you know, make him proud for all that he did for me. And I think Paul would say, no, no, God's grace saves you, but God's grace is there for you every single day of your Christian journey. The journey of Christianity is a journey from grace to grace, or another way of saying it is from faith to faith. The whole thing is this reliance on God's grace for salvation, but also for growth in the Christian life every day of our lives. So what I want to do is I I want to leave you, I'm just making that connection between those two things, and I want to leave you with this thought and then give you a little space to reflect. And the thought is this, I think fundamentally as Christians, We need to learn to rely on the grace of God every single day of our Christian journey, which is to say we need to learn how to live by faith all the time. We need to learn to trust God in every stage of the journey. And specifically, I think we need to to stay connected to that poema, that new creation that God worked in us when we first came to faith. We need to be reminded what happened. What were the dynamics? What were the inner dynamics in my heart and mind that God worked? I need to stay connected to the thing that God created in me, which essentially was faith. Because that's the thing that's going to enable me to actually walk into these good works which God has prepared in advance for me. So here's what I want you to reflect on um, this morning. First, uh, What do you actually look like 
when you're relying on the grace of God, when you are trusting God and living by faith, um, what version of you emerges when you're doing that? What does that actually look like? And then you might want to ask the opposite, like, and what version of you emerges when you're not, when you're disconnected from God's grace in your life, you're not trusting him, you're kind of living on your own and for yourself. What tends to happen? And I want to share my answer to that question, um, not because my answer is particularly interesting, but just to maybe stimulate your own thinking about your own life. All right. So I'll share mine and then I'll give you a little space to consider yours. All right. So I'll start. I was just thinking through it this week. How, what, if, what version emerges when I am not living in God's grace, when I'm not trusting him and I'm living just uh, in my own kind of willpower? I came up with three words that kind of summarize my experience. Uh, the three words are, I live um, in ambition, I live for performance, and I live in anxiety. Okay, so let me just tease these out for a second. So when I'm not connected to the grace of God in my life, here's what happens. I live an ambitious life, meaning I, I find myself driven by this need to try to be extraordinary. And the reality is uh, when I'm not connected with grace, I'm fearful that I'm actually entirely ordinary and I don't like that feeling. And so I'm driven by this need to be, to prove some, you know, prove myself and to be extraordinary. And that lives, that leaves me living my days um, restless and hurried. I feel hurried because I want to do stuff. I am less present um, to the people around me. I'm much less present to all the blessings that are around my life all the time because I'm, I'm moving forward on this, this quest for, for extraordinariness. Um, performance, that's the second word. Um, when I'm not living in God's grace, I have this profound fear of failure, of making mistakes, of not living up to my own expectations. And so what I'll do is I'll just go through my days working hard to essentially avoid failure. Like that's the goal. Don't blow it. Don't fail. And so I'll approach messages like this with the task of just make sure it doesn't stink. Like, you know, you've got you've to hit the bar. Um, you've got you've to make the grade. And I'm actually not thinking of the people that I want to bless and want to teach and want to encourage. I'm more thinking about myself and making sure that I don't fail. And I approach all my tasks in that way. It's just this avoid failure because I'm not living in God's grace. So ambition, performance, and the last one that I experience is anxiety. I live a much more fear-based life when I'm not living in God's grace. And I go very self-protective. I, um, I don't take risks. I play it safe and I try to please the people around me as much as I can. So that is, that's the old Dave that prior to the poema that God worked, that still creeps up when I'm not connected with God's grace. When I am connected with God's grace, um, here's what happens. And really, when I kind of gave my life to Christ in, in college, what God did was take this anxious, ambitious performer <laughs> and brought freedom and joy and love and, and even playfulness. I, I, I began to rest in God's grace. And so here's the version that emerges when I'm connected with that new creation with the grace of God. Um, that ambition for greatness in me is quieted. It just, the, the volume is turned down. I realize it's okay just to be me. And I move through my days much less uh, hurried, much less restless, and I'm much more present to the people throughout my day, whether that's my wife or my children or my friends or people I, I work with and, and just the people around, I'm much more present and I'm especially present to all the blessings in my life. I'm able to see them and take them in and enjoy them. Uh, my, my need for performance when I'm in God's grace is actually replaced by love because what, what's taken away is this fear of failure. Because when I'm connected with God's grace, it's actually fine to fail. Like failure's not a big deal. And so I don't have to fear it anymore. So then my motivation becomes not all about just making sure I don't fail. It actually becomes, how can I love people? <laughs> how can I bless people rather than worry about how, how I succeed in this? And so I'm, I'm freed up from performance and I'm free just to love and encourage to give the gift of whatever it is that I can give to people. And then finally, my anxiety um, when I'm living in God's grace is replaced by trust. 
and this calm assurance in God's protection and provision over me. And actually, I end up living a life that's more courageous, that's more creative, that's more adventurous, that's much less anxious. All that to say, when I'm living in grace, I become a more humble person that has nothing to prove. I become more present to the people and the blessings in my life. I am more freed up to love people and I'm freed up to take risks, be creative, have adventures, and then be okay if they don't work out so well. So that would be my own process with this. I know that was an extended conversation, but I, I hope that that triggers certain things in you. So what I'd love to do is just give you some space to, to ask this question. When I am not in touch with God's love and grace and, and, and blessing in my life, what version of me emerges? And when I am in touch with that poema, with the, with the, the new creation of, that God has worked through his grace, what are the good works that I tend to walk into when I'm in that place. So what I want to actually do is just give you a moment of silence. And we'll just, we'll just put an image on the screen and, and give you a moment of silence to think about that. Lord, what version of me emerges when I'm connected deeply with your grace? And I'll close that in prayer. So Lord, uh, we present ourselves to you this morning and we offer you ourselves and all of our brokenness, all of our imperfections, and we pray that you would root us and ground us more deeply again in your grace. Root us and, and ground us in that poema that you created in us, that place of faith and trust in you that comes with being a new creation so that we then this week might live from that place and walk into the good works that you have prepared for us this week. It's such an encouragement to consider that you have already prepared good things for us to do, acts of love and trust and generosity and patience and kindness all through this week. So Lord, ground us in our new identity in you that we might walk into these good works this week. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Well, we hope that you have been encouraged by the message this morning, and we would invite you now to consider some of the reflection questions that we'll put on the screen. And let me just end our time together with this great benediction. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.